talking today about uh, a retrospective security review of Apple's mobile security ecosystem. We've learned about uh, Android, so I'm really curious to see what's going on in the iOS world. Cool. The floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to spend the time after lunch uh, focusing on iOS security. It's my pleasure and Linux X pleasure to be here with you in the Black Hat sessions. And uh, the first uh, statement we are going to start with is that is that uh, many people in the industry think that um, iOS is probably the most secure mobile platform. Okay, you will take your own conclusions or get your own conclusions at the end, I, I expect, okay? And when we are talking about iOS, probably you know that uh, the new version, version 10, is coming next fall, okay, with new features, and we're going to see, uh, okay, how it changes the, the current Apple ecosystem. So the talk is divided in two different parts, okay? At the beginning, we are going to talk very briefly about the state of the art for iOS, okay, in the industry, and then malware and developers. And then we are going to jump into a complete whole different set of topics. As you can see, they are very basic topics, meaning the security topics like the lock screen, Wi-Fi, digital certificates, so on and so forth. And we're going to see some research I did in the past, what is the current state right now with the latest version we have, 932. That's the, the overall perspective. So uh, first thing, when we are going to talk about apples, okay, how do they look like in the market, okay, in the industry? Do you know that more or less IDC says that Apple uh, it's coping like 15% of the market, although this is not really true because it depends. This is like a worldwide, wo worldwide statistics, but it's not, it, it changes a lot depending on the uh, country. Okay. For example, in the US, uh, the adoption is much much bigger. I don't know why, for some reason, IDC has stopped uh, publishing this kind of statistics. Probably they know what the trend is, and basically it's the same for years, so why bothering okay, publishing them? As you can see, Apple increases every fourth quarter of the year, basically because they typically release in the fall the new iPhone model, and as a result, more people get them. Okay, that's the, the idea. Something that is interesting too is the adoption. The adoption rate when a new version of iOS is released is pretty high, okay, compared with other platforms. A lot of people start using the new version, but it's not because of the security features. It's because of the features, the new capabilities, and people want to take advantage of that, and therefore they uh, start or try to start using the new version. Then it gets really flat. And from a numbering perspective, we have had iOS for 10 years uh, uh, this year when, with the new version that will be released with multiple iPhone, iPads uh, models, iPad mini, the standard ones, the Airs, the Pros now, so on and so forth. But what I'm mainly interested in is in the sec official number of vulnerabilities. And I remark official because we know about other vulnerabilities that didn't get any identifier, any CVE associated to them, okay? so. Let me give you some numbers. I remember, I still remember when, when the first iPad was useless, okay, when Apple released iOS 6, okay, because it has almost two, 200 vulnerabilities, and as a result, the, pre, the, the original iPad that remains on iOS 5, okay, is vulnerable to 200 things, new things, okay? Then we have around 120 for iOS 7. How many do you think we have had in iOS 8? Any guess? Come on, your best bet. One, 100, more than that. 200, more than that. Okay, we had 272, which is not bad. What about iOS 9 up to now? More, less, 300 over here? Hmm, pretty close, okay? Almost 300 already. So it, it seems we are not improving, or we are adding more capabilities that obviously uh, imply more vulnerabilities. The Watch OS or the Apple Watch is not far from that, okay? The numbers are pretty amazing too, 150 for all the different versions we have had up to now. So that's our, these are the general numbers, okay, we have. Okay, let's focus on the details. If we talk about iOS malware or mobile malware, probably you are going to think on something like that, okay? 
we associate that to Android, okay? Mobile malware is, is for Android, right? Uh, in iOS, we don't have any, any malware viruses, so on and so forth. Okay, we're, we're going to focus the first per, uh, portion of the talk on the details of how the trends are changing regarding iOS malware, okay? So during the, the presentation, I'm going to provide you some ideas that, that probably we need to demystify. To, and one of them is, Okay, Apple doesn't want to have any antivirus, anti-malware uh, software solution running on the devices. So if we don't have a name for them, they don't exist, right? Or how are we going to name them, classify them, so on and so forth? We'll see how, how to manage that. Okay, so you have multiple links here in the next slide regarding malware specimens we have seen during the last year, 2015 and early this year, okay, for your pleasure. But we are going to focus mainly on two topics, okay? How to distribute apps out of the App Store, the official App Store, and if there is a way to use private APIs that have been mentioned before in order to do things that are not supposed to be possible, okay, from the developer perspective, okay? So the focus will be here. Let me tell you, uh, Apple has different uh, developer programs, the, the one for the individuals and the one for the enterprises, okay? The one for the enterprises basically costs $300 per year. The one for the individu individuals is $100, okay? And how can I distribute apps out of the App Store? Basically, this was designed for corporations to be able to create their own private store in order to distribute apps to their employees inside the enterprise without making those apps public, okay? The, the, it's a set of private apps I want to manage internally. However, from a legal perspective, you are not supposed to be able to distribute that out of the store. From a technical perspective, as we are going to see, it is possible to do that. But it was only recently, like two, between two and a half, one and a half years ago, that malware authors started to figure out that this was possible and start to take advantage of, of that, okay? That, that was the, the huge change. As we are going to see, the user originally, because this has changed recently, all they need to do a couple of taps, in reality is one tap, to get infected, okay? So we're going to see how this, this works, okay? So it's basically two taps to rule them all, okay? That will be the, the case we are going to cover next, okay? So how it works? If a developer wants to distribute apps out of the store, what is going to require? It's going to need a to, to join, to register for the Apple Developer Enterprise Enterprise Developer Program, okay, $300 per, per year. It's going to generate its own certificate. It's going to use a provisioning profile that, that is going to allow him to take the app and push that in real devices. And it's going to package the app, okay? The and iOS apps are distributed in IPA files, iPhone packages, okay? together with a manifest. The manifest is a plist file, a property list file, an XML file with information about the package, the, the dot .ipa, okay? That's the idea. It's going to create a link like the one we have here, ITMS services, okay? It's going to point to, and that's mandatory, to an HTTPS, okay, encrypted uh, website. And in the website, it's basically going to put the plist, and that's it, and distributes that link. Okay, this plist file is going to point to the IPA file, to the package with the application, and that's all we need. In this case, keep an eye on that, we are creating a link, so the user needs to click on that, but this is not required. You can go to a web page and automatically put an iframe, an, I an image, whatever you want, that will automatically download the app into the victim mobile device. That's another option we are going to see with a real malware specimen afterwards, okay? So that's it. That's all it's required. The way you distribute this link is whatever you want. It could be in instant messaging, emails, web pages, so on and so forth. Okay, so let me cover here a couple of uh, scenarios. The one on the left, okay, is for before iOS 9, okay? And in fact, it was a, a real app, as you can see here, that is, it was distributed via Twitter, announced there, you go to a web page, the user click on the link. As you can see, the link is this ITMS services link we have seen before. So you click on that, and basically it says, do you want to download this app? The user say yes, and the app starts downloading, okay? Uh, we are making the difference because 
this started to become so prevalent that Apple had to change the default behavior in iOS 9. It's the one we are going to see afterwards. Okay? As you can see here, I'm going to settings general, and we don't have any developer profile yet there. It's, it, it will appear under VPN once the app has been installed. So basically, the app comes together with a provisioning profile we have mentioned before in order to run in the device. Okay? So this first click we saw in the web page is not required. Here we have the, the profile that has been installed in the device. And basically, we can run tests. So as you have seen, with two tabs, we have an app out of the App Store running on the device. As you can see here, in fact, this app, uh, I was aware of that because I was teaching the SANSEC 575 class, the mobile pen testing class. And one student in class came to me and said, Raul, I have seen this app, which is, as you can see, is to measure your internet bandwidth. Okay, uh, Most of the web pages that measure your inter internet ba bandwidth are using what kind of technology? Most of them. What web technology is used to measure your internet bandwidth from web pages? It's HTTP, HTTPS, but what is the client technology that runs there? It's Plus most of the time. And Flash cannot run on iOS devices. So that's the reason why they are creating a new app, if it is HTML5, can be used to in, in iOS, in order to do that. And it's not malicious. It's basically a method to have beta testers testing that. Okay? It's breaking the terms of service of, of Apple, but that's fine. And this is the same scenario with iOS 9. So you see the same tweet. You go to the web page. You have the link. You can click the link. Okay? And uh, same idea, okay? The link is pointing to the ITMS services link we have seen before. I just want you to see the difference on the behavior in the from the client perspective. You are asked for for the app to install the app. You say yes, you install it, and here's the change. Now the app is being installed, but the first time you are going to run it, it won't run as it did before in iOS 8. You will get this new pop-up saying this is an app coming from an untrusted developer you need to trust this developer. So in order to do that, same idea as before. You go to settings, you go to general, you go to the new profile that has been created there, and you trust that developer. Okay. So what have we seen? We have started to see malware authors that try to infect iOS 9 devices, and they provide instructions to the victim user saying, please, in order to run the app, go to settings, general, profile, and trust our profile. And that's it. And the user follows the step. We have the same behavior. Okay? Social engineering mixed with the technical okay, process there. Okay. With that, we have seen that we can distribute apps out of the store. The other topic we mentioned is private, private APIs. So let me summarize that. In the iOS platform, we have two, type of, two types of uh, application programming interfaces. Basically, libraries available. The public ones that are available for every single developer, or the private ones that are typically used internally by Apple, but they are not available to the developers. Okay? But they are there. I mean, if you reverse engineer the platform and find them, you potentially can use them. If you submit an app through the App Store, you know that Apple has a betting process or a review process where it's going to check the apps for lots of different things. And it's going to confirm if <coughs> the app is valid to be published okay, on the official store. Obviously, if you are using pri private APIs, they are going to st uh, I mean, block the app. It's not going to be published. So potentially, the way to avoid that, and we have a few examples of that we are going to see in a second, is <coughs> you know that in Objective-C, you invoke methods from an object, okay, uh, passing messages, okay, and we send this object message sent, and you invoke what is the class name and what is the method name you want to to invoke in in the object, okay. So what if instead of providing there the real class name and the real method name for the target object of a private API? We don't put that in the code, and we resolve that dynamically when the app is running. Basically, we can obfuscate or even encrypt the class name and the method name, and at runtime, the app will de obfuscate or unencrypt those names and will use references to DL open, DL sim, okay, or references to get the class from a string, for example, in order to okay, invoke those classes. These techniques have been used extensively by different apps published on the App Store for that specific purpose. 
So surprisingly, in October 2015, there were two independent research that focused on that. Okay, on the first one, as you can see here, from about 2,000 different apps, 7% of them were using 150 different private APIs, okay, from apps in the real official app store. And another one analyzed around 256 different apps, and plenty of them, same idea, were based on a specific advertisement library. It was a binary library that was using private APIs. If you incorporate the library in your app, your app starts using private APIs in order to be able to access sensitive information from the user, report that to a remote command and control server. In this case, it was based in China, so on and so forth. And it was using the methods we have seen before, basically, the selector or class from a string and, okay, creating that on the fly. Okay? With that in mind, iInspector is one of the well-known malware specimens that was published on October last year using both techniques we have seen. It was distributed out of the App Store using developer enterprise certificates, and it was using private APIs, again, to access lots of different information about the user and about the device. The list of install apps, what is the, the app that is currently running, in order to be able to modify some behavior from mobile Safari, in order to be able to or had capabilities to uh, display ads in the environment, thanks to the library we, we mentioned before, so on and so forth. And as you can see, the way they distribute that is with the same method we saw before, but using an iframe. So automatically, you go to the web page, the app tries to download to your, your device, so on and so forth, and, and progress from there. So that's a very good example. However, iInspector didn't stop there only. It was using capabilities we discovered in order to hide the icon of the app in your device. So surprisingly, in the info.p list file, which is like the Android manifest file, okay, for, for Android, that contains all the properties and, and features capabilities of the app, there is a, a specific private tag that was being used by Apple for some internal system-based apps, okay, not to display any icon. Basically, Apple has apps that are running on the device with no icon because they don't need any user interaction. This is the specific tag. It's called SV from a Springboard. A springboard is like the desktop, okay, where you have all your icons arranged and all that in iOS. App tags, hidden. If you put that in your app, the icon will be hidden. Okay? When you see this kind of information, it's, it's always a good idea to, to, to test that in your lab environment to see how it works, so on and so forth. And I did that because I wanted to provide you what are the, the real state now with the latest version available, 9.3.2, and this is not working anymore. Okay? In 8.3, it stopped working. And Apple figured out that malware authors were using that, this technique, and therefore they removed that capability. Okay? So it's not possible to hide apps anymore using this technique. However, there is a glitch, there is a flaw in the way uh, the icons are, are managed in, in iOS in the latest version, 9.3.2, as we are going to see, where you can try to move, we're going to see that in the video. If the springboard, the first pane, is full of icons, you drag your app icon you want to hide into another icon. It creates a folder, but instead of creating the folder, you uh, drag that into the dock, the icon disappears. Okay, it's a temporary situation. If you reboot the device, it reappears, okay, but it disappears from there. Still is available from the spotlight. Still is available from the settings storage because it's taking storage space on the device, but it disappears. So let me show you that. Here we have one of my testing apps there. I'm going to drag that to the first pane. It's full. I'm going to put that in a folder, but I don't release that there. I go to the dock in the middle, and you see that it disappeared. So you go back to the third pane, and it's not there anymore. Okay? When you reboot, it will be back. But for now, it's hidden. So that's interesting because we can start combining some of these techniques for specific targeted attacks. Okay? I can install an app with an enterprise developer certificate and then hide it temporarily so you don't see the app is there, but it's doing things in your phone, things like that. Okay. Let's combine this kind of malware distribution with a new feature that has been introduced in iOS 9 Xcode 7. 
okay? It's focused on developers, and it's a common sentence we use in security, right? It's a bug or it's a feature, what we are going to see. What do you think? Is this a bug or is a feature? It's a bug feature or feature bug, or I don't know how to call it, okay? So don't worry, it's, it's, a bug, no, it's not a bug, it's a, it's a feature, what we are going to see. So let me, help me with that, okay? So what is this? What is the WWDC thing? What is that? It's the Apple Worldwide Developer Conference. Okay, the latest one took place in San Francisco last week. Okay, with the new features. Okay, uh, there these numbers were announced. What is this? Two million and thirty million. What is two million? Number of apps in the App Store nowadays. Different apps. What is thirteen million? <laughs> now, the number of malware in the App Store, you will have the reference later. We have had like eight different cases with malware in the App Store up to today. Okay? So, fortunately enough, it's not 13 million. <laughs> it's the number of registered developers. Okay? Interesting. Okay? Because if you look at that and you have two, two, two million apps and 30 million developers, there is something strange here for me. Right? Because you should assume that there is one developer per app, or, or perhaps two developers, but six times more than, than the number of apps. What's going on there? Apple announced that proudly, but I, I was thinking, deep thinking about it, and say, what's going on here? And perhaps it could be related to what, what we are going to cover next. So in Xcode 7, when iOS 9 was released, Apple introduced a new pack, a new feature, okay, that allows you to sideload apps. What is this? It's the capability for anyone with a developer account, but not an official developer account, I will make the difference, to install an app locally on any real physical iOS device through the USB port, okay? So basically, in the past, Apple has a really regulated market. You need to register as a developer. They are going to identify you. They provide you a certificate, so on and so forth. It could be through the individual Apple developer program, through the enterprise Apple developer program. But now, anyone with an Apple ID can take an app, develop an app, and install that on any real device. This is completely new. What do you need to have an Apple ID? An email. What do you need to have an email? a computer <laughs> to register wherever you want, okay? Gmail, Hotmail, so on and so forth. So you can start creating fake Apple IDs and use those to dis locally distribute malware. If I get access to your device locally for a few seconds, less than a minute, I can install new apps on your device, which was not possible before at all, okay? So basically, the process is the same we have seen before. I install the app. In this case, I call it basic. Okay? You see that when you run it, it, it will ask you to trust the developer associated to that app. So you need to go to settings. You can see the difference here. In the profiles, you can have enterprise developers, as we saw before, or you can have individual local, let's say, developers. Okay? You go to the de developer. You trust the app. Okay? You say, yeah, I want to trust this developer. And here we go. The app now will run on the device, okay? With this idea in mind, you need to take into consideration that there are some features that are available to both the individual developers with no verification at all from Apple and the ones in the official program, and some features that are not available, okay? But even if you don't have access to Apple Pay or the Cloud Kit, things like that, there is a lot of, a lot of damage you can still do with this capability. And because of that, probably you have heard about a new tool, okay, framework called Sua Cider, okay, that was released recently, okay, in Black Hat Asia this, this year. And basically what this framework is doing is, it's going to take a, a, an already available app, an IPA package, okay, the app you can get from the App Store, any app you want, let's say Skype it. It's going to, I mean, we have processes in order to analyze apps and all that in the research to uh, decrypt the app, okay? So once you have the decrypted IPA package, what can you do? You can modify it. So this tool is modifying the package in order to introduce malicious behavior into the app, 
and reinstall the first time or, or trying to upgrade the app on the victim device through USB locally. Okay? In order to do that, remember, you need to have local access to the, the victim device, and it should be unlocked. Okay, we need to unlock the device in order to approve the untrusted developer, so on and so forth. If not, you won't succeed on, on the attack. Okay, that's the DS scenario. Okay, so well, let me go here. So this tool is basically a set of scripts that automate the process, automate the process of creating the provisioning profile we have mentioned, of modifying the app, of reinstalling the app on the device, so on and so forth. As a result, with a free Apple ID, you are going to be able to inject, for example, a dynamic library on into any app that will provide you extra capabilities, such as those available from Secrypt. Okay, it's a, the mobile substrate framework and Secrypt, probably some of you know about that, allow you to modify, okay, due to the reflect, reflective properties of Objective-C, to modify the execution of, of the apps or of the programs when they are in, in memory. So let me show you. The, the original demo that was, was uh, uh, available here, where you can see that you run the script. Basically, you, you select what you want to inject into the original app. So basically, in this case, it's, it's like the tweak associated to Secret to be able to modify that. You select an app name, and basically, you create a, a structure there. From there, we are going to run the uh, script, and the script is going to take the IPA file, the iPhone package application, in this case, Skype it, okay, in order to inject that malicious behavior. With that, we are going to run the, the, the final script, the SUA Asider script, okay, and uh, it's going to generate the new package. Okay, that's the idea, to have the reference to the video and all that. So basically, this is just creating the configuration profile, signing the app, so on and so forth, okay, creating the whole process like you will do from Xcode, but modified in order to inject malicious behavior. As a result, if the phone is connected to the computer through USB, it will install the new version of Skype in, in, in inside the phone. That's the, the overall idea. And uh, basically, that's that. You simply provide the credentials for the Apple ID we are using for this purpose, a fake one. And you see here Skype. Of course, it's a self-signed there. Uh, application, so you need to trust the developers, going the developer going to settings and following the whole process we have seen before. So no difference here. And the main difference now is that the new app we have installed, it's not only Skype, it's a Trojanized version of Skype with extra capabilities. In this case, the ones associated to Secret. So as you are going to see, when we launch the app, okay, it's going to request notifications to the user and all that. So basically what I want you to see is once we are here, let me speed that up a little bit. Let me do let me do something so that you can see that with no issue. Okay, I think it will go up now on the screen and you can you can see. No. Okay, so let me let me do this for a second. Because it is going to be better for you to to check that full screen here. So let me go back here. And you can see that we have or we get access to Secret. Okay. We were over here, so here we go. Okay, here we go. So as you can see here, we are running Secret down here. We are getting the memory reference to the app we are running, which is Skype. And basically the next thing we are going to do is we are going to modify the text of the main window there. So the text that is here appears on the username or whatever field. You have full capabilities to modify the app there in memory when it is running. Okay? What is the main problem here? That now we can inject apps locally through Xcode 7 or similar, similar tools. Some of these features that we have seen here, uh, I mean, these features can be used now with the latest version of iOS. However, in the past, it was also possible to upgrade a tool. So as we have seen here, we didn't have Skype. We installed a Trojanized version of Skype. If we have had Skype before, in the past, it was possible due to a second vulnerability where the bundle ID, the identifier for the app, was not properly checked to replace the original Skype with the Trojanized version. Okay? This was fixed in iOS 8.3, 8 okay? but 
the same researcher, okay, Chilik, Chilik Tamir, the same researcher that released Suicider, the previous tool, research, uh, sorry, released extra research about how to overcome that. And the, the process is very simple. Basically, after 8.3, Apple is not allowing us to replace the app. Okay, so what can we do? We can make a backup of the device. We can delete the original Skype app. We install the new Trojanized Skype app, and we restore the backup. Where the data associated to the Skype app is going to be restored in? In the new Trojanized version of the app. And therefore, we are going to have access to the previous data that was <coughs> associated to the legitimate version of, of the app. Okay? The tool that is available for that is called Sandjacker, but has not been released yet because the latest version of iOS is vulnerable to this still today. So till Apple releases a fix, the researcher is not releasing the tool, the pr uh, proof of concept tool. Okay? And the final variation we are going to, to check for, for that. The final one is called Sidestepper, was discovered or published by Checkpoint. And basically, it's the same idea we have seen, but leveraging the mobile device management, the MDM systems, we have to manage mobile devices at the enterprise level. So basically, the flaw or the feature that is still available there is the following one. If the app is being installed by the MDM solution, you are not going to be prompt for the enterprise developers, so on and so forth, as we have seen in iOS 9. So basically, this attack is based on the fact that if I can hijack the communications between the MDM server and the iOS device, I'm going to be able to replace the command I want to send to the device. In this command, I can say, please install this app. I point to a different app store I have prepared myself, and the whole process will work as we have seen, but without prompting the user to accept or trust anything. Basically, it will be installed. Okay, the key point here is how are you going to hijack the communication between the two? Basically, you need to somehow force the user to accept a new CA, a new certificate that will impersonate the MDM system. Okay, so it's a man in the middle attack, basically uh, manipulating and hijacking the, the traffic. But it's a new variant that applies to, to our scenario. Okay, okay, with that, uh, it doesn't have a lot of sense, basically, to go through all the details here. What I have tried to do here is to summarize what are the different attack vectors that are available nowadays to distribute malicious iOS apps, okay, based on the fact that your device could be jailbroken, game over, or non-jailbroken from the App Store. We have had several specimens, uh, malware specimens, in the official App Store or out of the App Store with the different methods we have seen. Okay, so you have all the details here. We have had also several malware abusing enterprise developer certificates, and you have the names of the different specimens there. Okay. Okay. With that, we have covered malware developers. We're going to jump into the uh, next section. So we're going to move fast on this section covering specific vulnerabilities I knew about in the past that are still affecting 932 the latest version of iOS. In order to do that, I dig in the old trunk, okay, the digital trunk in this case, searching for my vulnerabilities. So let's start with the lock screen, okay? Something critical to protect the device. Okay, for the lock screen, something you need to practice a lot nowadays is called something called voice hacking. So start preparing your voice because we have more capabilities to interact with the devices through the voice. Okay? There is a page we maintain here in the Dynosec blog basically reporting all the different lock screen vulnerabilities that have affected iOS over time. And we keep that updated since September 2014. Okay, so in iOS 5, we had four, and then eight, 12, 11, and so far in iOS 9, we have six, okay? Let me show you the kind of vulnerabilities we have, okay? This one, I mean, Apple released iOS 9.0.2 just to fix this one, okay, from a security perspective. And it's based on interacting with Siri. That's the reason why we mentioned voice hacking. So as you can see, the phone is locked. Okay, it has uh, a passcode set. It's iOS 9, it's a six-digit passcode. So you enter the passcode five times. And before entering the last one, okay, we're going to take advantage of a kind of race condition 
in order to interact with Siri. So we press the home button at the same time we are entering the last digit there, as you can see, and you ask Siri something. Okay, in this case is what is the what is the time? What time is it? Okay, and it says it's that time, because you can select the time, you can select different time zones. Okay, and you can go there. In order to select the specific time zones, you can type them, and therefore you can enter text. Because you can enter text, you can copy that text and send that to another app, such as Messages. So you redirect your text, that is the time zone, to Messages, and from Messages you can start typing a message. Okay, the message is going to go to someone, okay, so therefore you can go into the contacts and therefore select the contact you want to send the message to. Okay, that's the idea. What else do you think you can access from the contacts? Because not only you can select the existing contacts, you can create new contacts. So for example, you're going to create a new contact there, and what else, or what kind of information do you associate to a contact? Details about the phone, the number, I mean, email and all that, and the picture for the contact. For from the contacts, we access the pictures on the phone too, okay? So think about it. From what time is it, we ended up on messages, contacts, pictures, so on and so forth which is kind of crazy, but it's the, the way it works, okay? So here, here we are. Next topic, digital certificates. Okay, so digital certificates, we know how we use them, and in fact, recently, in, in the, in, in last week in the WWDC, uh, Apple said that they are going to force all apps at the end of the year to only be able to speak HTTPS, okay? The problem is that, you need to speak HTTPS to uh, encrypt the traffic, but you need to identify that you are connecting to the right server, okay, through the certificate. Use authentication there. So, could you please let me know what this is again? Help me with that. Which are these, these two buttons, okay? Continue and details trust. What is this? What happens if you click these buttons? Continue or details trust? in mobile Safari, in iOS, latest version, 9.3.2. It's game over. The certificate gets installed in the device, is considered as trust, for how long? Sorry? Forever. Okay, it doesn't matter if you try to uh, clear the cache, the history, in the mobile browser. It doesn't matter if you reboot. It remains there forever, okay? Let me show you that. So, if an attacker is capable of launching a man-in-the-middle attack against you, and, okay, the user clicks once on that certificate, game over. The attacker is going to be able to hijack all the traffic going to that specific site forever, okay? We know about that before 2012, and it still has not been fixed by Apple, okay? We don't know why, and we don't have capabilities to manage those certificates in order to, to remove those uh, certificates. So you saw there that we are running 932. Here I'm connecting to HTTPS example.com. We can see the details, okay? I can put here my own certificate with the data I want, okay? In this case, I'm saying it's, for example, .com coming from Dynosec, and uh, I'm going to click cancel. I don't want to become infected. But now I'm going to relaunch the page again. Now I'm going to become a victim. I click on continue and we connect. And it's game over. There is no way I can remove that certificate from my device. Okay? If I go to settings, for example, Safari, okay, we clear clear history and website data, okay, we go back, we close Safari, we go back to Safari, we relaunch the page, you will see we don't get any error anymore. And the attacker is in the middle, it's still there, okay? The only way you can clear that out is, okay, as Confucius said, never use a canyon, uh, okay, to kill a fly, which is basically that. Is you can go and say reset all settings or reset all network settings and the certificate will be removed but all your other settings will be removed too. So probably that's not a good idea. From an MDM perspective, there is a small setting you can enable in order not to allow your iOS users to accept untrusted certificates. So that's the best solution, but it's only available for MDM properly configured. Okay, next topic. 
patch software updates, something critical for the security of the devices, right? So that's my question. If you report a vulnerability, the vendor says that it has been fixed, it has been fixed, right? You don't need to worry anymore, or perhaps not. OK, there are fixes that probably doesn't work very, very well. OK, that's the, the point we, we want to emphasize here. So uh, you have more details here on this link. I did a research where, just very briefly, when the iOS device is going to contact the Apple's software update server, you can modify the traffic because it's using HTTP and not HTTPS in order to impersonate Apple's server. And although the XML files we have here are signed, I can launch basically a replay attack. I can launch or I can submit a XML file from a previous version of iOS, and the device will freeze. Okay, in my original discovery, I could freeze the current version of the device forever. I could say, you are going to remain in your version till 2025, and it will stay there. Apple uh, generated a CVE fixing a couple of things on the server side, on the client side, in order to, to avoid this kind of, of manipulation. But they didn't properly fix it completely. So uh, still today, it is possible to freeze your device till the next version. Let me explain you that. Now you are in 9.3.2. Therefore, Apple, I mean, I attacked you. I leave you in 9.3.2. Le let me recap that. You are in 9.3.2. Apple has released today, imagine, 9.3.3. Okay? It's, uh, we have the beta version right now. So it's going to be released in a few weeks, probably. So 9.3.3. I attacked you today, and I tell you, no, 9.3.2 is the latest one. And your device will never, ever get 9.3.3. You, it will wait till 934 is released, and you will remain on not on the latest version for some time. Okay, I publish about that. You have the details on the DinoCycle app, okay? And then I start researching on the Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch update mechanism is really similar to iOS. It just takes the, the files, as you can see, from Watch and Watch software, the documentation, so basically same idea. And this is what, what I discovered. So basically, what, what we discover is this. As you can see here, I go to my device. It's running 9.3.2. I have Apple Watch. In this case, Apple Watch is running version 2, but the latest one is 2.1.1. So we are going to check for updates in the device. This is updated, 9.3.2. Now we are going to move into the Watch app in order to check for updates for the watch, not for the device. You see that the time and everything is automatically, so I'm not modifying time or playing with that locally. We go to the WhatsApp. Here we go. We go same idea. Okay, we go to to uh, uh, software update, and as you can see, it's going to say that version 2.0, which is the one here, is the latest one. Although 2.1.1 is the latest one available, so we have freeze this this watch till the next version is released. And still, this is working today. And just to finish with the presentation, OK, let's cover Wi-Fi. OK, Wi-Fi, a uh, wireless technology we use extensively. So think about it. What are the vulnerabilities that get a CVE assigned to them? The ones that are really critical, right? That's the idea. So let me explain you the first one. I, uh, in this research I did in 2013, OK, we publish the following scenario. And the following scenario is when you are connecting with the device to an enterprise Wi-Fi network, OK, uh, an attacker can try to impersonate the enterprise Wi-Fi network, OK? And you get a prompt, OK? And this is the prompt you get to connect to the radio server. But what is the only option you have here? Accept and connect to the server, right? There is no cancel button. There was a researcher, Michael Santos, that reported that to Apple, and they added the cancel button. It's very critical okay, to, to have the cancel button there. Okay? However, there was another vulnerability we published regarding enterprise Wi-Fi networks, and it didn't get any CVE assigned to it. Still today, we don't have the CVE, but still today, we are vulnerable. So let me show you that in the, OK, this, this is the process how you connect to the to the network. As you can see, we have the cancel button there, okay, available. Okay. 
and you cannot differentiate between the legitimate prompt you get from the legitimate radio server and the one you get from the attacker if the attacker mimics the details on the digital certificate, except for the fingerprint, the hash, obviously. Okay, that's the, the idea. So let me show you that. Let me show you that. Okay, this is the setup, so we are going to bypass that. Uh, okay, this is the first time. Uh, the first time you connect, uh, that's important for you to know. So here we go. The first time you connect or you impersonate the corporate network, the Wi-Fi corporate network, basically the device is going to prompt you with the uh, certificate warning we have seen. Do you see the cancel button here? This is 932. It disappeared. So in the legitimate one, we get the cancel button. In my radio server setup, we don't get it. And then the device will connect, OK? What is going to happen when the device connects? Let me show you that from an attacker perspective. Basically, what I have here is I have running a, let me explain you that a second so that you can understand what's going on. What I have here is I'm impersonating the enterprise Wi-Fi network. So I have a DHCP DNS server. I have the radio server, and I have the access point. That's it. And here we are taking a look at the logs from the radio server. So basically, what we get here is when the device connects, it will connect to us. And if we have properly configured the radio server, we are going to get the user credentials in the clear, as you can see here. And for sub subsequent times, we or the, the victim connects to this network, we don't get the certificate. Let me show you that there. And we get the new credentials. So let me show you both. You see that it's connecting, and we get the credentials. Same behavior as in mobile Safari. The certificate, it's installed on the device. You cannot uninstall it unless you reset all the settings, and you will become a victim of that specific attacker forever. So in order to finish with that, some conclusions. Okay, I typically want to refer to okay, the Spanish collection of, of proverbs. This proverb, indeed, is well known even in English, okay, so we can we can use it. And basically it's the idea of that an apple a day keeps the intruder away. So we'll see if that's true or not. It's your own decision to see if the, the proverb is, is realistic or not. And and that's all. Okay. Any questions you may have, I feel free to answer them or I will be around if, if we don't have enough time. So that's that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.